lectures are really on quite different topics. Uh, today, um, today I'm talking about the proof of riemann roch for curves. So uh, uh, the next time I'll be talking about uh, riemann roch for canonical n-folds. And so, uh, you know, I think you may have heard the words riemann roch This is in n dimensions as a general formula involving Todd classes and Chern classes and lots of stuff and so on. And I want to give a, a kind of very quick way of presenting the whole results where you don't really need to know too much about Todd classes and Chern classes and so on, where you just get everything out very, very cheaply. And then the third one is uh, uh, orbifolds. So this is, the, the, this, is, this is today's lecture, and these two topics are Saturday's lectures. <coughs> so uh, the, the formula, the theorem says, uh, L of D is 1 minus G plus the degree of D plus L of K minus D. Right, so um, uh, you're supposed to remember this. This is something you're supposed to have in, in your active memory. Okay, so of course I'm going to, I will sort of give a slight, slightly more detailed statement of what the assumptions are. But, but let me, uh, let me I, I, I really want to give the whole proof as one single idea. And so I want to uh, say that it depends on, so the proof depends on three inputs. So I'll give some definitions later and so on, but just for the moment let me try and emphasize the logical structure of the proof. So A, I want a principal divisor divisor of a function has degree zero. Right, so I mean, in other words, uh, f has a uh, number of zeros equals the number of poles. <coughs> okay, so I'll come back to saying in slightly more detail what this means. Uh, for those uh, those of you who've forgotten it, right? And so B is there exists a family D n of divisors with degree of D n going to infinity. Uh, such that the difference uh, degree of D minus L of D and plus one remains bounded. Yes, so uh, I'm saying some, somewhere or other I can find, and the, 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 the point of the dn will be something completely explicit, but it doesn't matter what the dn is. As far as the proof is concerned, I'm just using this property. Right? So I can find a family of divisors, dn, that's growing bigger and bigger and bigger, right? and this ldn is following very closely behind. So, so the, the, the difference here the, the amount by which this L of dn drags behind, lags behind the d degree of dn, is bounded, right? And so eventually we can define, so two, with a little bit of thought, B allows uh, us to define genus of the curve to be equal to this is just the definition, the maximum of this difference.
plus one. Yes, and so this number is bounded, and so it 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 this it it, it it's uh, this is a set of integers that's bounded above, and so it's possible to say what the maximum is. Yes. Okay. So so this this is the this is the genus of a curve. <coughs> And so the statement C is concerning this canonical class. So uh, there exists a divisor KC with uh, <coughs> a degree of KC equals 2G minus 2 and uh, L of KC equals g. Yes? So later on this device at KC has lots of kind of magic properties, the canonical class, but for the moment what the only thing I need is the thing I'm stating. Right? So notice that this this is telling us that uh, this degree minus this plus one, so this is saying that uh, L of Dn, L of this KC is a uh, 1 minus g plus the degree, right, and then plus 1, right? So in other words, L of Kc is strictly greater than the Riemann-Roch formula, right? The Riemann-Roch formula being this, <coughs> yes? And so this is the last irregular divisor. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I will talk about the definition of these numbers and so on, say, say what the assumptions of the theorem are, but I want to make clear that there are these three very clear cut, very simple statements, <coughs> and uh, the, the, the whole proof just comes automatically in a completely formal way by just considering these, uh, these statements. Right? So the proof, will, the proof will be later. So this is a sort of quick path to enlightenment. You, can, uh, you, can, you don't need a lot of stuff. You just need these three statements. So I'll, I'll explain later. Uh, well, I've got to do the boring bits. I've got to do all the in introductions and the definitions and so on. Okay. So, um, so uh, C. So, so you know, this is sort of. Uh, I don't know, section one set up. Right, so th these are just definitions. C, a curve. So I want C in Pn, uh, some n, doesn't matter what. I want this to be an irreducible one dimensional variety. And I want him to be non singular. Right, so non-singular, I'm just going to take this as a definition, means uh, for all P in C, the local ring O, C, P. So this is, uh, uh, let me explain what the local ring is afterwards. The local ring O, C, P is a, a discrete valuation ring. So, uh, you know, now here's my curve C sitting inside projective space. I go to one point of the curve C and I define this thing here, OCP. So this is uh, rational functions, uh, F in case C, that are regular near, uh, regular in the neighborhood of P.
Yes. And so uh, rational function is the quotient of two polynomials. So I'm sticking to a little affine piece of the projective space. I'm taking the ratio of two polynomials. And then I'm, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm demanding here that the, these guys can be made regular in the neighborhood of P. So they can be written down as a fraction where the denominator does not vanish. Right? Now, having done that, then the, the local ring here is a discrete valuation ring. So a discrete valuation ring means that the maximal ideal at P inside OCP is generated by one element. So this is the ZP. Right? And so I'm really thinking of the ZP as being uh, a parameter along the curve. Right? ZP is a function on the curve there that vanishes exactly once. And it generates the ideal of all functions vanishing at P. So a uh, consequence of this, so you can read about DVRs in various uh, textbooks on commutative algebra, but uh, a consequence of this is that every F non-zero in K of C, let me write like that for non-zero, multiplicative, right? So I'm taking something which is a quotient of two polynomials here, and then I'm restricting it to the curve C to give a, a rational function on the curve C, uh, and he's non-zero, can be written uh, uh, Zp to some power v times a unit, right? times something that doesn't vanish. So if he's in the maximal ideal, then he's divisible. If he's regular and he's in the maximal ideal, then uh, uh, I can take out a power of p and, he's, uh, and I get something slightly smaller. So discrete valuation ring is an integral domain, which is a unique factorization having only one prime element. Right? So I'm writing here factorization in a discrete, in a unique factorization ring, and there's only one prime element. Right? And a consequence of this is that, and another consequence of this is that uh, all f, for all f in k of, k of c, non-zero, either f or f to the minus one is regular. Right. So this is, of course, a much coarser property in commutative algebra. Yes. And so, uh, and so, this number v here is called v is called the uh, the valuation at p of f. Right. And so, if v is uh, if v is positive, v p of f is if if this is positive then it says that uh, f has a zero of order uh, this vp, right? Or if vp is negative, it means that f has a pole of order. So now, uh, now this gets confusing, a uh, minus vp. <coughs> Okay, if it's zero, then it means he's a unit himself. <coughs> okay, so um, uh, a principal divisor principal divisor F is uh, a divisor of the form sum VP of F times P. Right? So, so and I, I take an element, a rational function, non-zero rational function in C, then at m almost all points of the curve, F is regular, and also F to the minus 1 is regular. Right? And so this VP of F is almost always zero. So I'm writing this here. This is a, this is a finite sum of points with integer coefficients. Right, and so this is a divisor. That, this is a this is the definition of divisor. Yes, and uh, and so this is this is a principal divisor. 
And so that's the thing I'm writing down here. It's the, the zeros of f minus the poles of f. Right? And I'm saying it's a theorem that, uh, the, that the, a principal divisor has the same number of zeros and poles. So I'll explain in a few words later why this is true. OK? So uh, what, what next do I want to say? <coughs> So, um, <clears throat> so there is this, the Riemann-Roch theorem concerns the vector space L of D, right? So L of D, and this is, this is, this is not really just an abstract vector space, this is a vector subspace contained in L in, in this function, in this field, K, K of C. Yes? And so it's um, L of D, by definition, is the set of F in K of C, such that divisor of F plus D greater than or equal to zero. Okay? So this is a clever way of writing it here. So it allows, it, when D is... Positive, it means that F is allowed to have poles of order at most D. Right? So, the, so, so this D, the, this, it, you know, the thing to think about when you see this expression is you want the D there to be an, a positive divisor, and then this is saying that, divisor of, that, that, that the F itself is allowed to have poles at specified points D with specified uh, numbers, with specified order. Right? So uh, I'm not going to argue the zero is in here. The element zero is in here as of right. right? And so this is, a, this is a vector subspace inside K of C. It's a vector subspace. Right? And we'll see in a while that uh, the statement A implies that it's finite dimensional. <clears throat> yes. So together with this, I can define o o c of d, and this is the sheaf uh, with basically the same definition. U goes to the same expression here, except that this now divisor of f plus d greater than or equal to zero is on U. Yes. <clears throat> so this is, uh, uh, when I write this down here, I'm asking about global rational functions on C, uh, rational functions defined on the whole of C, possibly with poles, and here I'm put, putting the restriction on how many poles they're allowed to have. Right? So instead of doing that, I can take as a risky open right, and then just write down the same definition here. And so the thing, now, now of course it's no longer a finite dimensional vector subspace, but it's certainly a vector subspace. So this is, this is contained, this is still contained in K of C, and it, it, but it varies with U. So, so this is what a sheaf is. It's a, it's a set of, uh, uh, for every open set U, I tell you what the sections of the sheaf over U are, and so it's, uh, it's this, this, this expression. Right, and so these are sort of basically. This is basically one idea. This is uh, <coughs> a simple, uh, simple idea. Okay, so what uh, what do I want to say now? Uh, So let me just give the let me just give the proof of the whole the whole the whole proof of Riemann Roch, starting from this A, B, and C and those definitions. So uh, together with A, B, and C, there are so so these things are these are these are these are things that require to be proved. These are hard. Uh, these are the you know the essential input steps. So together with that, uh, I'm going to write down three statements D, E, and F. 
that are just kind of trivial little remarks. So, there's no, you know, that I'll, I'll prove them as I say them, uh, but they're not, they're not, you know, they're not the same logical status of A, B, and C. A, B, and C are sort of building blocks, and the, uh, these, uh, what I, the things I'm saying here, D, E, and F, are sort of just basically uh, trivial little maneuvers, you know, little tricks. So D, or linear equivalent. Yeah, and so uh, we say that D1 is linearly equivalent to D2. So these are divisors on divisors on C. To mean that uh, to mean that the difference D1 minus D2 is the principal divisor. Some. Yes, and so if this happens, if so, then I can do multiplication by h, and so multiplication by h, so, so this is multiplication by h, goes from kc to kc, and it takes L of d1 into L of D2. Yeah. So this the statement is completely trivial. There's not, uh, absolutely nothing to prove here. Uh, so you can think of this as an exercise that uh, uh, divisor of F plus D1 is greater than zero if and only if divisor of f, uh, h times f plus d2 is greater than equal to zero, right? And if you sort of calculate what the divisor of, a, of a, h is, then there's a d1 minus d2 in it. So this thing here is divisor of a, f plus <coughs> d1 minus d2, right? And the statement is then completely, completely trivial. Yes? So, uh, so, so, so this was not this was not a hard step. On the other hand, uh, I'm going. To, so the the point here is that what the point of this is that it allows me to shift the goalpost. It allows me to move uh, the divisor that D that I'm arguing about. I can I can move instead of trying to prove something about the divisor D1, I can try to prove the same statement about D D2. So so I mean these two these two things are isomorphic under this. In particular, L of D1 equals L of D2. Just in case anybody is in, still in doubt, L of D is the dimension of L of D. Uh, <coughs> yes? So, uh, uh, so let me, let me say L of D for, for, for all, so that, you know, every statement here is for all C and for all D. Uh, L of D is finite dimensional. <coughs> right? And so these numbers, L of D, that I'm talking about are just finite numbers. So why is this? So I'm writing down this condition that L of D uh, so L of D is set of F such that divisor of F plus D is uh, uh, greater than or equal to zero. Right. And so I can do... Uh, So, so D has some degree, which is the sum of the, so if D is, if D is some NP, P, then this is just sum of NP. Yes, and uh, so, uh, 
uh, this divisor of f plus d also has has degree uh, some n p at uh, degree d the same de uh, the same the same degree d right and so you know that you can think of this as saying that uh, there are at most so many choices for this divisor here. Right? So there's a better way of arguing, which is this statement, the next statement I'm going to make, E. So if uh, uh, this statement E is saying that, you know, for all, for all C or D or P in C, if, I, 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 can, if I, I look at this condition, L of D minus P, right, and I say this is contained in L of D, Yes, so, so uh, when I'm doing this here, I'm asking that this thing here, minus p, is still greater than or equal to zero. So there's basically just one more condition. I, I'm, uh, I'm allowing f to have one fewer pole, namely one fewer poles at p. Or if the d is negative, I'm insisting that the functions here vanish once more at p. Right? And so this is a vector subspace. Right, so I'm saying I'm imposing one extra linear condition on uh, elements of L of D here, namely that they should have one fewer pole or one more zero at the point P. Right, and so the, the statement of E is that this has codimension less than or equal to one. Right, so... Uh, uh, Saying codimension is still a slightly vague statement because I'm, I'm trying to prove that they're, I'm still trying to prove that they're finite dimensional, right? So let's say it's uh, let's say it more more precisely, if f is in L of d and it's not in L of d minus p, then L of d is L of d minus p direct sum k times f. So I should have said everything is over fixed field k and the fit k is algebraically closed. I mean it doesn't have to be algebraically closed but for the moment I'm doing that. So in particular I'm allowing characteristic p, I'm allowing it to be any field but it's an algebraically closed field. Yeah. So the statement here is uh, uh, you know, there are, two, there are two possibilities here. Codimension less than or equal to zero means either zero or one. So if it's zero, it means these two, uh, these two spaces are equal, and then it's not possible to, make, to take an f which is not in there. Right? And so if the spaces are not equal, then take any element in the one which is not in the other, then it's a complementary basis. So f is complementary basis element. Yeah. So if these two spaces are not equal, then I can find some element f which is in there and not in there, and then, uh, and then the bigger space is the smaller space plus one complementary dimension. Yes? And so the way to use this is to, if I do d minus p1 minus p2 minus minus pn, right, then uh, L of this inside L of d has codimension less than or equal to, uh, so, sorry, let me not use n here, let me say a, less than or equal to a. Right, so I'm just repeating this step I'm repeating this step in an inductive way. So each time I subtract off one point, I say the codimension has either gone down by one or uh, it's, the space stays the same. Right, so at each, each stage when I remove one point, this, the dimension of this space drop, either drops by one or it doesn't drop at all. Yeah? 
And so uh, eventually, so degree of D is some integer. And so after, after uh, A is degree D plus 1 steps, I get degree of this thing, D minus P1 minus PA less than 0. Right, and so now, now look at, uh, take an element in, if I take an element F in this space, D minus P1 minus PA, then I've got to have, then I've got to have, uh, I've got to have uh, uh, F, divisor of F, plus, uh, and this D minus P1 minus PA, this is supposed to be greater than zero, yeah? But the degree of this divisor is zero, and the degree of this divisor is negative. I've arranged them to be less than zero, right? And this is a contradiction, right? I've got a, uh, an if, uh, I would have an effective divisor here. <coughs> and he's in effect, he's supposed to be an effective, he's allegedly an effective divisor, right? But he's got degree less than zero, so this is just nonsense. This is a contradiction. Right. And therefore, this space, the only way out of this contradiction is this space is zero. Right. And so, uh, if you go back up to L of D, at each of these steps, the codimension dropped by at most one. So, there was at most one complementary basis element. And so, that means that this space here, uh, so this, this argument proves a very simple argument, a very simple argument, but depends on my input A. Right? It implies that uh, the dimension of L of D less than or equal to degree D plus 1. Right? And so in particular, it's finite dimension. It makes sense to write down this L of D and treat it as a number. Yeah? Okay, so uh, I just rubbed off statement C. Statement C was saying, uh, so, so, so now I'm getting to the now I'm getting to the proof of the main points of Riemann Roch. So, um, so uh, a, this, this was a this was a little trick, right? So, little trick. Concerned with going from one point to one to one lower point, right? Now I'm going to now I'm going to do a combination of this trick twice, right? And so this is statement F. <coughs> so so this is a this is a sort of bigger trick. So this is a bigger trick. So it says, so G uh, as defined in point B and KC as uh, in point C. Right. So 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 this G was the max of this difference, uh, this was degree D minus L of D plus 1. And this KC was this guy that's got degree 2G minus 2. And uh, oh, what, else, what, what else was he? Uh, degree is 2G minus 2 and L of K is G. Right, then uh, L of KC plus P is L of KC. Right, so this is saying you can't have a divisor having a single pole. Right, 
So this is again for all C and all P in C. Right, and so in applications, this implies, so in applications what we're going to be doing is uh, this trick here, this little trick here, but I want to do it twice. So when I do L of, let, let me try and say it the same as I'm doing in my notes. So L of D minus P goes up to L of D, and at the same time I'm going to go from L of uh, K C minus D up into L of K C minus D plus P. Yes? And so I'm just, uh, I'm doing this little trick here, but I'm doing it in two uh, sort of dual ways here. And here I'm going up, here I'm going up from D to D minus P, and here I'm doing this dual thing. This is K minus C minus D, which is sort of, in some sense, dual to that guy, and this one's dual to that guy. Yes? And so this little, the little trick here told you that the, these, spe these vector spaces either stay the same or they go up by one. Right? And the statement is they don't, one of these must be equality, at least one. At least one of these must be must be equality. Yes, and so this is obvious. This is basically trivial, because imagine that I've got an element f in there, which is not there, and I've got an element g in there which is uh, not, in, not in there. So if f is in L of D with a degree, uh, so divisor of f plus D is 0 at P, right? So, so I don't allow this thing to, be, to vanish an extra time at P. And if uh, G is in L of k minus d plus p with uh, exactly the same thing here. D divisor of f plus k minus d plus p is 0 at p. Right? So this is saying that the, uh, the, if, d was an if, if d is an effective divisor, this is saying that the divisor of f, that, that, that f has a pole of order exactly the order of for d at p, right? Then this implies that f times g is in L of p plus p minus L of k. Right? And that contradicts this thing. Okay, so I want to prove this f. I'm sorry, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to postpone the proof of this F for one or two minutes. Okay. So remember, r r r remember, I'm proposing to set G to be equal to uh, the max of this difference. Um, degree D minus L of D plus 1. And this is, the max now is taken over all D devices on C, on fixed C. <coughs> yes? So, um, so, uh, Using these, uh, I, uh, so, so now I use, use B. 
Right, remember, I have these three input statements, A, B, and C, and I've used A here. I used A here to say that the divisor, the divisor of F had degree zero. Right? Now I'm going to use B. So I have these L of dn. Right? And so if I, if I, if I write, uh, you know, the, the assumption was that degree of dn minus L of dn plus 1 is bounded. So let me write this less than or equal to gamma. Gamma, gamma will be the genus. Right? And so, so, so the, this L of dn is growing almost as, as, as the, the same as degree of dn plus 1, right? with only this difference, uh, little increment down, gamma, where he's allowed to lag behind. Right? And so in any case, this is saying that the L of dn grows as much as I like. Right? So this grows, this grows to infinity. Right? So if I take any, take any divisor D, take any divisor D, yes, then uh, this, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, well, the, the statement I want here is that the degree of dn goes to infinity. Right? So now the degree of dn, the degree of dn minus the degree of d, well, uh, this is a fixed number, and this is a number that's growing to infinity, right? So eventually, this number here will be greater than gamma, right? And then, then L of dn minus d is not zero, right? And what this says is that dn minus d is linearly equivalent to an effective divisor. Right, and so I want to argue. I want to argue about L of d. Right, I, I want to argue that this guy L of d is also big. So, so I'm allowed to assume that the L of I'm allowed to assume that the L of d L is big. At the moment, I'm trying to prove also that L of d is big. Yes. So, uh, uh, so I can replace. Uh, L, I can replace D by uh, <coughs> uh, Dn uh, minus this effective divisor. So up to linear equivalence. Yes? So the thing I'm saying is that I, I want to prove something about L of D, right? And the thing I want to prove is that this is greater than or equal to L of dn minus the difference in degree, minus the degree of dn minus d, right? And uh, so, the, the, because I said that thing about linear equivalence over there, uh, I can just replace D Instead of taking, instead of arguing on D, I can argue on uh, Dn minus this effective divisor. Right, and so let's think about what happens when I go from Dn down to uh, uh, D. Right, down to Dn minus. So, so, th so this eff effective divisor. Let's again call him P1 plus plus Pa. Right? So the degree goes down by the degree goes down by A. Right? That's that, that that's just choice of my notation, P A here. And uh, the L of D N is goes down by at most uh, L of D N goes uh, so so the L of D the L goes down by at most A. But every step here, possibly the dimension goes down by one, possibly he remains the same. So he goes down by at most this A. 
And so therefore, also, the L of, of D is also greater than or equal to uh, 1 minus this gamma plus degree of D. Right? So, the, so Dn satisfied this condition, that, uh, that L of Dn is greater than or equal to the degree of Dn plus 1 minus gamma, right? and D, D also satisfies the same thing. And so therefore, the, the effect of this is that if I, if I define this number here, this number gamma here, to be the maximum of these things taken over the Dn, then that's exactly the same thing as the maximum taken over all D. Yes, so uh, this is an easy argument, but it's uh, a little bit, uh, you know, wordy. You have to repeat these arguments several times. So the maximum, so, so this G is the maximum of uh, degree D, the maximum of this discrepancy, L of D plus 1, is the same as the maximum of, uh, taken over my Dn. Yeah? And so in other words, this gamma here uh, if, I take, if I take this gamma to be the, the maximum value of these things, then gamma is equal to G. Yeah. And so, and so, and this is just the definition of the genus. Right? And so, you know, in some ways it's completely cheap here because I'm just defining the maximum to be the number so that this L of D is greater than or equal to. plus degree D for D. Yes, and so this is just, I'm just using the definitions. So the, the, the point is that to point, the point is to know that these numbers are bounded above, so it makes sense to take their maximum. Right, so I've taken, I've got their maximum. So now, uh, furthermore, this is maximum and the, and equality Equality happens for some D with degree D as large as I like. Right? So, so, so this thing here, this number, uh, goes up to gamma and it stays at gamma all the way from that, from that point onwards. Right? It goes up to a maximum and then doesn't increase anymore. Okay, so now I'm going to say something much, much more precise. So, so now we're getting now we're getting very close to uh, true uh, and you know really useful statements. So I say there exists a divisor d naught with degree d naught equals. Uh, G minus 1 and L of D naught equals 0. Right. So l l let, me, let me decorate this equation with a number. Let me call him number equation 1. Right. And so this, the next statement I want is that equality holds in 1 for all d with degree d great, strictly greater than 2g minus 2. So let me write greater than or equal to 2g minus 1. Right? So I'm saying, first of all, I just have equality and now, uh, an inequality. And now actually that inequality is true almost all the time. Right? And so, uh, you know, those of you who know Kadara vanishing, this is the canonical class plus an ample divisor. <coughs> lots and lots of kind of culture here, lots of hints about cohomology that um, <coughs> I'm just, it's really useful to uh, work them through, understand where they're working. Okay, so why do, how do I prove this? So 
equality happens for some d. So, so take some d with equality. Right? And I'm assuming that L of d, I'm assuming that L of d is not zero. Yeah? And so take some f in L of d, right? Then divisor of f plus d <coughs> is uh, an effective divisor. Right? This is effective. But this means it's a finite sum of points. Yeah? So take any point which is not one of these points. So take P, which is not equal to one, any of these. Yeah? And so now I'm just going to go from D to D minus P. Right? And if, I think, if you think about what I said, I've got L of D here. And so this is now uh, L of D minus P plus K times F. Right? So uh, this guy here is, a div is an effective divisor. It's a sum of, pos a sum of points with a sum of points, uh, possibly with multiplicities. Right, I'm choosing a point which is not one of these points. And so necessarily, I'm choosing some point which has coefficient zero here. So if I try to subtract that off, what I'm, I'm saying is I'm taking all the functions in this space and I demand that they're zero at P. Right? And by, by construction, the F is not zero at P. Right? And so therefore, I'm in, this, in the main trick there, in the, the little trick one, I'm in this second case. I'm certainly in this second case. You know? So I find I took a divisor D with equality holding there, and I'm assuming that L of D is not zero, and I say I can subtract off one point. That's I'm passing to a degree a divisor of degree one less. So now I've got so the conclusion here is that <clears throat> the conclusion of that argument is that if equality holds for some d with L of d not equal to zero, then it still holds for L of d minus one. Right? So the conclusion is that equality holds in this statement one and L of D is not zero, then uh, I can pass to D minus P with equality still holds. But so uh, L of D minus P has decreased by one, is one smaller. Right? And so this continues down until I get to zero. So therefore, there exists a D naught with equality holds. So each time, each time I'm subtract, I'm taking this divisor D and I'm subtracting off a point P, which is not in the uh, base point of the linear system D. Right? And so, so linear system has uh, any effective does has at most finitely many points in his support and taking some point which is not in that support, right? And L of D naught equals zero. Yeah? So I can, I can take the L of D and I can cut him down by one each time on a completely reliable basis whilst keeping the equality, right? And, and then, so this means that, uh, this means that um, degree of D naught equals one minus a uh, d minus one. Yes? So now so this proves this first dotted statement here. 
Right now, if d if d has d degree d, if if d, if, uh, if degree of d is greater than two g minus one, then uh, degree d naught uh, d, d minus d naught has degree. has degree are greater than or equal to g, so L, so this L of d minus d naught is greater than zero. Yeah? And this means just play the same game now going down from d naught, d down to d naught. Right? So d naught was a case of equality. I can think of d as obtained by uh, by so, so at d naught, this the, the difference, this difference, uh, degree degree d minus l of d plus one is already at its maximum. Already at its max for d naught, right? And so this is this this d minus d naught. So it's an effective divisor. So up to linear equivalence. I have uh, d minus d naught is um, if it's linearly equivalent to uh, 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 again p one plus plus p a, yeah. And so uh, so as I go up from d naught up to d, which is d plus d naught plus p one plus p a, then this maximum can't increase. Yeah, so it stays. So the L of L of D stays at its maximum value, right? Which is uh, one minus D, one minus D plus degree D. Yeah. And so you know, you know, this is a this is a good result. We're almost we're almost there. We have a we have a sort of pretty good understanding now of when. When the uh, uh, when equality holds in this uh, in this statement, right? So now I want to now I want to finish the statement. I want to do the the rest of the 